How many people saw the or, or watched the congressional testimony? I think it was March or April with Mr. Adrian Obamovich. Okay. If you didn't see that, it was very um, informative and a little bit shocking. Um, he was identified and I think fined by the uh, FTC for uh, $120 million. And I think he generated over 100 million robocalls in just a few months selling timeshares. And um, he admitted, uh, well, I should say he admitted that he was alleged to uh, generate robocalls uh, using the name of various respectable timeshare operators. And then when someone expressed interest, he transferred the caller to um, a timeshare reseller in Mexico who's not associated or affiliated with those respectable timeshare providers. And he said, well, people want to buy those. I'm just calling them. During his testimony, he emphatically stated that carriers such as AT&T and Verizon were the good guys. He said that that's, don't blame them for all these robocalls. He said the problem is with some of the smaller carriers that turn a blind eye to receiving millions of short duration calls. He said to the FCC and the Congressional um, the senators that were holding the hearing, he said, those are the ones that really contribute to the problem. So, I'm glad that we have the good guys on the panel, at and and Verizon, um, and we're going to hear about uh, how, they're, how they're addressing this problem. The, the topic of know your customer is a very broad topic. It means, I think, different things to different people. Um, this phrase came into my vernacular uh, within the last six to eight months, so it means different things to different people. And the way we're going to structure this panel is we're going to give each panelist eight to 12 minutes to kind of provide their perspective of the problem uh, and the solution, uh, what works, what doesn't, uh, what's effective, what's needed. Um, because it's a fairly complex issue and a little sound bite doesn't necessarily convey what they're doing. And then I'll be asking some questions, and then at the end, we'll open up for audience questions. So, um, Chris, I'm going to start with Verizon uh, first. Uh, can you give us your perspective of how Verizon is addressing this? Happy to. Thank you, Carl. And, um, let me start by just thanking Pace for the invitation <coughs> and for the collaboration. Really appreciate it, Stuart and, and, and others. Um, for the interest in this dialogue, which we, we really think is crucial. Um, and, I, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a lot of discussion yesterday of is there a chance that legitimate calls get caught up in blocking, filtering, labeling solutions and how to fix that. We agree that that's very important. I would submit that probably even more important to those in this, in, in this audience, along with my company, is saving the voice channel from becoming something that's not attractive anymore to consumers, right? I mean, to the extent that consumers get to the point where they cut the line and don't even have telephones and don't even pick up telephone calls uh, because they don't trust voice calls anymore, um, that's a problem for our business model in terms of selling voice services. I think it's a problem for your business model also in terms of being able to make sure that your, your, your customers um, pick up the phone and don't just routinely ignore incoming calls. So, so um, restoring trust in telephone calls, I think, uh, just really is imperative. Um, if, you, if, you, if you, you know, those of you who saw the panel yesterday, I think it was abundantly clear that the enforcers explained that enforcement hasn't dented the problem, right? Um, so we're not going to fix robocalls by just having stronger enforcement. Um, it's also clear that blocking uh, has a lot of challenges, a lot of limitations. We're not just going to block our way out of the problem, right? Um, and stir shaken holds promise, um, but it'll be a while until it really starts to be something that benefits consumers and, 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 and legitimate callers. And so Verizon's position is that part of the end game on really addressing robocalls in a meaningful way needs to be know your customer procedures. It needs to be stepping in 
to appropriate processes and procedures that uh, voice uh, providers need to be applying uh, in order to make sure that they're not part of the problem, right? Make sure that that smaller carrier, typically smaller carrier, I mean, I think we need to make sure that it's not the larger carriers, but I, you know, I think you, when, when we trace stuff back, there's a, you know, a certain group of carriers that seem to be consistently looking the other way um, when they know or they should know that their customer is pumping millions and millions of illegal calls uh, onto the ESTN. Uh, and so what Know Your Customer is about is finding ways that make sense to those of us, that, and of course we all have to step into the same, to the same processes and procedures. What's good for the goose needs to be good for the gander. So those of us who think that our customer base is, is legitimate need to be able to sort of subject ourselves to that scrutiny to make sure that that's the case, right? But there needs to be a consequence for that, that, that carrier that's looking the other way. Uh, I think that, that staunching robocalls at that origination carrier point needs to be part of the end game because if it's not, We've seen with blocking, and we'll see it with stir shaken, that bacteria evolve. They'll figure out what defenses we're putting up in terms of identifying and blocking unwanted calls. They'll figure out how to work around the defenses. Uh, and so what we need to do is really get to the origin. So what does, does Know Your Customer look like? Well, I, I think as a starting point, there's low hanging fruit that um, I think is common sense, and I want to sort of vet it. Um, you know, with other carriers, but also vet it with the calling parties, right? Because I'm not looking to impose any new burdensome obligations on calling parties or on carriers. Um, what I'm looking for is sort of sleeves off vests that I think we all sort of do anyway, and then make sure that there are mechanisms in place to sort of make sure that everybody does it, right? So I think common sense is you have to know who your customer is physically. Where is the customer located, right? If somebody wants to find them, who are they? Where are they? Um, uh, um, are you accepting Bitcoin in payment? Well, if you are, I think that's an issue, right? I mean, I think you should be able to trace, um, you know, wh where the payment's coming from and who the, and who the customer is. Um, you should know, sort of, to get to sort of more robust type, type programs, I think you should probably look at whether or not your customer is making phone calls, you know, that appear to be um, spoofing patterns to avoid detection. I mean, if they're changing the, the, the outgoing phone number on every single call they're making um, in order to uh, uh, potentially evade blocking tools on the other end, that's probably consistent with illegal traffic and something that you should be thoughtful about. Um, seal of approval. Talked about the seal of approval idea yesterday a little bit with, with Pace sort of stepping into that project, which we think is crucial. I think it would be extremely helpful to have a um, baseline seal of approval that a, that a calling party can obtain. And it strikes me that you can kill two birds with one stone with a seal of approval. Number one, it could be something that the originating carrier would look to to say, okay, that customer is vetted. I see the seal of approval. I'm good to go in terms of serving that customer. Know your customer, right? Make sure that your customer is not um, illegal. Um, but at the same time, I think the same seal of approval could be used, and we talked about the feedback mechanisms, the need for analytics companies who are trying to figure out what to block and how to block traffic. They could also use information about approved seal of approval uh, companies and their phone numbers and their campaigns in order to improve and you know, ensure that they're not blocking traffic that they shouldn't be blocking. Uh, and so it strikes me that the seal of approval project is crucial. Um, and we're interested in this sort of self-regulatory theme that, that you talked about at the beginning of the, of the program. Um, we um, are not interested in stepping into regulation if it can be avoided. We have told the FCC that um, there is a collectivity problem, right? I mean, it is a problem that the two carriers that are talking about Know Your Customer are Verizon and AT&T and the guys that are actually initiating all the illegal traffic aren't in the room, right? Um, and where you have a collectivity problem, the, the, the question that arises is, is that an appropriate um, uh, reason to, to lean in on towards sort of targeted, focused regulation that looks to be as, burden, as, as 
burdenless as possible, but nevertheless sort of focuses on uh, requiring bad actors to you know, shine a little bit of light on their practices. So we've invited the FCC to look at that. We're not specifically proposing anything, but I think at the end of the day there is a, a holdout problem, and I would invite um, um, the rest of the ecosystem to think through how to deal with that holdout problem. The, the last thing I might note is that there is um, a role for running uh, metrics on traffic that originating carriers are handling in order to uh, make sure that they're not part of the problem. So I get every morning a couple of reports in my email box along with a bunch of other Verizon people that simply does some very simple, basic, kind of baseline metrics reporting that any wood carrier can calculate very easily, sort of um, something called that we call a robo-score, which is basically a combination of a couple of metrics that are known to be associated with illegal robocall traffic but are not necessarily indicative of illegal robocall traffic. So for example, we've noticed, and there's a lot of learning on this over the years, that illegal robocall traffic tends to have certain characteristics, right? Um, and um, so, for example, very short duration traffic, you know, somebody picks up and only talks for 10 seconds, tends to be associated with what the bad guys are doing. Also can be associated with legitimate traffic. We'll talk about the false positives if we want to, but tends to be associated with illegal traffic. Large numbers of cancellations, large numbers of, of you know, very high unanswer rate. Uh, you roll those into a metric, you look at it, you can start to get a sense as to sort of what your traffic patterns look like. <coughs> extensive, extensive spoofing of phone numbers that uh, aren't assigned to the company. Um, extensive neighbor spoofing, you know, you know, how many different phone numbers are going out with the traffic that is, that is being outpost. Um, you have bad guys that literally every single call going out, they're, they're, they're outpulsing a different calling party phone number. Um, I, I would be hard pressed to, to, to think of a legitimate reason for doing something like that. Um, and then of course, just the spamness of the traffic. How, how is the traffic triggering on the analytics providers? Is it, is it coming up as, as malicious, um, potential spam, potential fraud? Those kinds of metrics are associated with, hey, what does your traffic look like? So Verizon does those metrics. We've invited you know, the other carriers to do the same thing. And we do it not because we think that our customers are part of the problem. In fact, quite the opposite. We're not looking to look over anyone's shoulder in terms of you know, making sure that you're TCPA compliant or anything like that. It's simply that we want to make sure, we've been telling the regulators all these years that we're not part of the problem. We want to make sure that that's true, really. Um, and um, so we look at these traffic uh, patterns from our entire customer base, wholesale, retail, every IP platform, uh, and then we look and see whether or not there's anything interesting. Uh, and we've told the FCC, this is simple to do. This is really like any VoIP provider could do this kind of thing really easily. So if you have um, a VoIP provider that ends up being the originating provider, at, you know, Kevin will talk about traceback, but you know, you trace traffic back to a suspicious provider who seems to be outpulsing a lot of illegal traffic, maybe that guy should have to be reporting to the FCC which of its customers has high robo scores uh, and which doesn't, so that the FCC enforcement people can start taking a look and say, okay, um, that's interesting, let's look at it. Sometimes you look at it, it's a perfectly legitimate customer, right? I mean, I can count on my hand how many retail customers Verizon have, have anything that's interesting. And when they do have something interesting, as a TCP expert, I can sort of look at it and say, okay, looks like you're scrubbing, you're not calling wireless devices, um, doesn't look like the spoofing is anything unusual, um, doesn't look to me like it's the kind of thing that should cause anyone to, to, to be concerned, but worth looking at it. And, and, the, and, and, and what I'm trying to drive towards in terms of know your customers, instead of me making that subjective determination because I know something about the TCPA, I would like it to be standardized. I would like there to be a seal of approval that anyone can look at in order to say, okay, that's an okay customer. I don't have to worry about whether or not I'm part of the problem uh, as a carrier. So that's where, where, where Verizon is going. We're looking to go with the know your customer concept. Thank you, Chris. Um, a couple questions I had was, and you, you answered them, um, how do you know your customer um, if, if they're 
doing unusual traffic, and it sounds like you, you monitor their characteristics. And the same thing with wholesale providers. We talked about the robocall score report. The question that occurred to me is, what do you do when you do find a wholesale carrier that all of a sudden raises a red flag on the robocall score report? Or if you do have one of those, let's say, five retail customers that uh, raises questions, what do you do in response to that? Yeah, so Verizon is, is, is really just looking at this in terms of making sure that we know our customer base. And, and uh, we are reaching out actively to wholesale customers, um, working with them so that they can run their own Know Your Customer metrics. We've shared with them the, 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 the simple calculations to do what we call a robo score, which we think could be easily standardized um, in order to um, help them to look at their customer base. And, and, I, and I will admit that um, the wholesale piece of it is the most challenging, right? And by far the most interesting, interesting Verizon customers that we have are in the wholesale space, right? So in other words, they have a sleazy customer upstream from them um, who is pumping a lot of traffic and it gets to our wholesale gateway. We take that traffic uh, along with the good traffic um, and, we, and, we, and we pass it on getting that wholesale customer, or maybe its wholesale customer, to make sure that its retail customer is, is, is legitimate, um, requires standardization. Because we would put it into the contract um, if we could, if there was something standardized to put into the contract. Currently, there's nothing standardized. So that's kind of the project that I, that I would invite um, the rest of the ecosystem to help to help. That raises another question. Are you finding out that some of the wholesale carriers that are providing this traffic are surprised uh, that they're actually re receiving this from their customers? Yeah, I think that there's a, I think there, there's a lot of them, and I think there's a lot of diversity. Okay. I'll leave it at that. That sounds like some are surprised and some aren't <laughs> surprised. <laughs> okay. Um, next, uh, we're going to hear ATT's perspective, uh, courtesy of Linda Vandaloo. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, first, I want to apologize for two things. One is I've been on vacation and got back last night, so a lot of you have sent me emails asking to connect and for meetings. I, I apologize. I got a lot of emails and I didn't get to all of them, so I apologize for not responding. I'll be around this morning, so if you want to uh, grab me and, and talk to me, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. The second is, um, speaking of emails, I didn't read all of Carl's email telling me I have, I'm have i going to be talking for eight minutes. So if I ramble a little bit, I apologize for that too. Uh, I should know better. I should always read Carl's emails. <laughs> So um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about what AT&T is doing and how AT&T looks at the whole problem. And we, we believe that not, it, no single tool is going to solve the problem. It has to be a comprehensive attack on the, on the robocallers, on the bad guys. Um, so we've, we've done, we do a lot of blocking, uh, network blocking. and. Um, do the same kind of analysis Chris was talking about. We get daily, hourly um, uh, feeds of uh, the data, the, the traffic, and, and we look for uh, suspicious traffic. Once, um, once a suspicious calling pattern is identified, then it goes to an investigator, and it's a very manual process. So the first thing they do is call the number. So if we call the number, we get me, then you know we say, hey, you know your 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 number is generating all these calls, and 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 so that either we work with them. Sometimes it's a bad uh, auto dialer. There's something went wrong. Sometimes it's a, a customer being spoofed. But the customer has the opportunity to say, okay, this is this is this is what the problem is. If it's a um, if it's a customer of another carrier, then we'll refer it to the the other carrier and say, hey. This, this is happening on your customer's uh, number. Uh, but we use a whole series of tools to investigate, and we are almost 100% sure, we can never be 100% sure, but almost 100% sure before we ever block the call. And we only do like the mass campaigns. 
Um, so that's one of the tools, and it's a temporary tool. Blocking is not going to solve the problem because these guys are really smart and they're going to find other ways around it. Blocking only keeps that large volume of calls from getting to customers while we, uh, the industry works on a traceback and, and enforcement, and, and Kevin will talk more about the traceback process. Um, there's also some opt-in tools where customers can sign up for blocking and labeling tools, and you'll hear more about that later. Um, and then uh, Chris mentioned shake and stir. Uh, the caller ID authentication. And um, just a little bit about the status, what's happening there. The FCC had asked the North American Numbering Council to form a working group to come up with a proposal for setting up the governance authority, how this caller ID authentication, how the certificates are going to be managed uh, when it's implemented. And uh, we did, we came up with a proposal to have the whole governance authority in place in a year, which involved uh, the industry identifying who the governance authority entity would be, and then the, they will um, issue an RFP to get the policy administrator and, and to get the certificate administrator process in place. And we are um, uh, opt <laughs> hopefully, um, on track to have that in place by uh, May of next year. Um, making good progress, we've got a little bit of a late start, but I think we're going to make up time. Meanwhile, um, many of the service providers are going to start implementing. Uh, some of us will be doing field testing fourth quarter of this year, and several service providers have committed to start implementing on a manual basis before um, everything's in place uh, next year. So we aren't waiting, you know, till May of next year, and then we're going to figure out how to do it. We're, we're going to start doing it. So hopefully, we'll start seeing some results pretty quickly. And I'm also uh, cautiously optimistic that as more and more service providers do implement, then others will come along and, and um, we can do this without a regulatory mandate. Um, and then the know your customer, um, you know, that's another very, very important component. I think, um, you know, Verizon's a little bit further along. Uh, we have always done analysis on our retail customers when we have large volume. Uh, customers, when we when they sign up for service, we do we do an analysis and, and, and kind of do a vetting, check them out, and make sure they're legitimate customers. We also monitor our network to make sure that our customers aren't the ones that are committing the fraud. And and uh, like Carl mentioned, Abramovich said, yeah, AT and T, Verizon, they're not going to have me as a customer, and that that's very true. So um, that's kind of an overview of, of how we look at it. Um, okay. I, I have a specific question about um, text calls or texting. Um, I personally have an AT&T wireless phone, and I can't remember the last time I got a spam text. And I think it was probably a year, two years ago. And it was an isolated incident. Um, so why is it that I don't get spam text calls on, from wireless carriers? And, and same thing with the other wireless carriers. They seem to have that problem resolved very well. Uh, why can't they apply the same thing for texting? Or um, what can we learn from that? So one of the biggest challenges that we have with the voice calls that um, we don't know what the content of the call is. For a text, there's ways to put in place filters to um, filter out those calls that are, um, you know, spam. And so, um, but, but unless we listen in on the phone calls, which we don't, uh, there's no way of actually doing that. There is a, um, there is a vetting process. Um, or they call them short codes, so anybody who is sending out mass uh, texts goes through, um, get, to get the short code, you have to go through a real vetting process. Um, 
and that's you know that's something that you know we're looking at as an industry. I think you know that's 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 the type of thing that um, Chris had mentioned that you know Pace is talking about. You know the possible uh, you know the seal of approval for the customer, and so so that that will help. So, but we could we could learn from that uh, process and by adopting that for voice calls for high volume originators. I think so. But I, I um, am trying to set something up to get the criteria for um, for the um, short codes and to see if that is something that would be useful for us to um, to implement as well. Do you see any uh, regulatory uh, proposals on the horizon that would help or hurt or that are needed that aren't being proposed? Well, anybody who knows me knows that you know I kind of chant no mandates. <laughs> <laughs> no mandates. Um, the I think that the, the relationship we've had with the regulators has been very positive through this process. Uh, since the industry all came together and started working together, we've had a very cooperative, cooperative relationship with the regulators. Um, I think mandating any of these, um, it, it's premature to talk about mandates. Um, I, I understand the collectivity problem that, that Chris is, is talking about. Um, I think that, let's see how the industry plays out. My biggest fear is once there's a mandate, you know, like we we're talking about, these guys are really smart, so we get mandated to do a specific uh, thing, and they go around and find another way of getting into our network and we're still stuck doing the thing that they were mandated to do. So, uh, you know, the, the, the regulatory, um, uh, the FCC is really looking at actually going the other way and giving us more flexibility. Kevin Ruby will give us a, a unique perspective because he has insight over um, the carriers as a whole and knows things that AT&T and Verizon necessarily don't have access to. So tell us all the secrets, Kevin. Yeah. Oh, man, I am the man with the secrets. Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to thank Stuart and Carl and Pace uh, for having me here this morning. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, this is an important issue. Um, and I'll tell you, just you know, from a narrative perspective, uh, about five years ago, uh, I got a knock on my office door saying, you know, the FTC's on the phone and they want to talk about this robocall issue. I'm like, well, what's that? Um, and over the last five years, this issue has completely subsumed my personal and professional life. Uh, just nonstop. It's all robocalls uh, all the time. And quite frankly, it's no wonder, okay? Because shortly after, you know, this issue started coming to the fore, um, you, you saw just massive, and I mean massive, uh, consumer and governmental interest on this issue, okay? Uh, it is the number one complaint at the FCC. It is the number one complaint at the FTC for several years running. Um, consumer groups, it is a, a major issue for consumer groups. Uh, and I also say this in, in all seriousness. In the nation's capital, in today's political environment, uh, several, both Chris and Linda said, we take U.S. telecom takes and our industry takes, and I think most folks that are engaged on this issue take a holistic approach to this, right? There's no single silver bullet uh, that's going to solve this problem. So, you know, we have been consistently talking about things like consumer tools, which you've seen an explosion in consumer blocking and labeling tools over the last couple of years. We talk about things like consumer education. Right? Consumers, uh, you know, the IRS is never going to call you and ask you to pay in an iTunes card or an Amazon card, which, which happens. Um, we talk about technological deployment and standards, like shaking and stir. That's a piece of it. Um, and we talk about enforcement. Um, 
FCC, FTC have civil enforcement, we certainly, um, we, we have stated that we're supportive of criminal enforcement. Uh, we think the, the issue warrants it. But another big piece uh, that we have focused on that does relate to, to know your customer um, involves traceback. And before I jump into traceback, I just want to emphasize some of the points that Carl raised in his opening remarks regarding Adrian Abramovich. And I really would encourage every person in this room, uh, you know, <laughs> even on the weekend, like pull up YouTube, pull up this guy's testimony, uh, because it is fascinating and it's important. It, it gives you the mindset into how these illegal operators um, operate. And as Carl noted, it was a $120 million fine uh, that was issued against Mr. Abramovich. Uh, he, was, he, he was basically found, he was cited, found formally, uh, of generating over a billion, with a B, a billion uh, robocalls in the span of, of several months. Um, and what's really fascinating about that testimony that, that everybody has touched on here, and, and I'll say for the record, I, I was in the room when he testified, and when he came in, we all thought, okay, this guy's gonna step up to the table, he's gonna plead the fifth like any you know, reasonably, legally advised person would do, <laughs> because, think about it, the Senate Commerce Committee is going to be sympathetic to an illegal robocaller. They're, they're going to give them, you know, please tell us how you feel. Like, not going to happen. But there he went, and for a good 45 minutes, he gave you a peek behind, you know, a peek under the hood. How they operate, how they think, what they do. Um, and it was noted before that that one piece of the testimony was really fascinating because Mr. Abramovich talked about how the software is out there to generate these calls, but he needs somebody to put these calls onto the network. And he specifically says, oh, I can't go to a company like AT&T or Verizon to, to put these calls on the network, but there are five or six out there that will take these High, you know, high volume, short duration, low contact calls, they will take as much as I can give them. Um, and he talked about, he used the word, he used the specific word fueling. He said these, these folks are fueling the robocall epidemic. Because here's the key thing that the FCC found that I think is relevant to everybody in this room, the final citation that was issued to Mr. Abramovich. Um, they, they identified three victims. They said consumers are victims, obviously. They said carriers are victims because they're getting all this traffic and their subscribers are getting hammered with this traffic. The third victim was the brand holders, you know, folks in this room who are calling on behalf of legitimate companies. So we want to find who these five or six or however many providers are out there. So about three years ago, US Telecom started something called the Industry Traceback Group. It currently consists of about 25 facilities-based providers, okay? So a lot of my members, like AT&T, Verizon, cable companies, Comcast, Charter, Cox, wireless companies like Sprint, T-Mobile, wholesale providers like IntelliQuint and Bandwidth and West, uh, Google is a member, we have Bell Canada from up north, but it's 25 providers. And the reason traceback is important, remember when you were a kid and you played that game telephone, where you, know, you passed the message to the person sitting next to you and it went down the line? A phone call works much in the same way. It can transit multiple carriers as that call goes from origination to completion. But each carrier in that hop can only see to whom they sent the traffic and from where they got it. So what we do in Traceback, we have an exception under the, the statute uh, for CPNI, Customer Proprietary Network Information, that allows us to share 
basically call records amongst ourselves. It's, if it's being done to protect the consumer or the networks. So what we do, if you imagine that you know, line of eight people playing telephone, you know, the first, let's say, five are trusted carriers in the ITB group. We trace a illegal or su suspicious call back as far as we can through the trusted members. And then once we get outside that loop, we start reaching back to folks that are outside of our group. And we ask them specifically, where did you get this call from? Who sent it to you? Here's the details, give it to us. Um, and our goal is to get to the origination of those calls. That's what we want to get to, who originated these calls. In some instances, we've been successful. Um, in others, we hit these providers that you know, basically want to hide and don't want to provide us with information. So we source that to the, uh, to the FCC. We'll provide a referral to the FCC and FTC. They have subpoena power, and they can work their way back. Um, we've made, I'd say, close to 30 referrals to both agencies. Um, and, you know, but it is, it's a laborious process, it's a challenging process, and this notion of know your customer, you know, one of the things we talk about is that there should be, um, you know, providers should be participating in traceback. It's, it's, it's a good policy, it's a good goal, um, and there's no reason not to do it. So, um, you know, we're big believers in it, um, and, you know, we think that traceback can be a, a very powerful tool uh, that gets to, um, you know, finding these five or six providers that Mr. Abramovich talked about. Thank you, Kevin. Um, it sounds like the traceback procedure um, in the current SIP environment is manually intensive. Um, is it better designed in a shaken and stir environment, and how would that help things? So shaken, shaken can definitely help, um, because right now it is a manual process. It's a very manual process, um, and we you know, literally coordinate by email and phone calls and things like that. Uh, what shaken does in a, in a pure shaken environment, ideally, um, whoever originates that call will assign a, a token, if you will, to that to that number. And that that token, uh, you know, it, so long as it's passed throughout the entire call path, that will tell us who the originating provider was for that call. So it kind of obviates the need. For, for traceback in that, you know, if you have a token associated with that call, you can go right to the origin. I, I suspect in the future, once that information is available and discoverable, if, if the violation is a statute that provides for a private right of action, that plaintiff's lawyers will love this and jump on this because it will help them essentially enforce the legislation. In other words, um, originators beware if you're going to be a scoff law because if the regulators don't get you, the plaintiff's attorneys will find you. Potentially, and I, I think one of the issues you run into is we all know a lot of these calls originate from overseas, um, but I'm sure the plaintiff's bar will figure a workaround for that. So. Carl, Carl, just one comment on that though. I mean, I, I think that the TCPA enforcement. Um, story really is remarkable in the sense that plaintiff's bar never goes after the bad guys. Really, right. I mean, right. I mean and, and you, you heard Lois yesterday, she pointed to DISH and as, you know, as a lawbreaker, and, and that's fine, but the DISH um, story played out the way it should, which is professional enforcement agency um, identifies a case and, and, and brings the case, and then I believe after that the plaintiff's bar uh, jumped on. Yeah. And, but you never have one of these like plaintiffs going after the, the, the actual true bad guys sort of straight up. Uh, and so I, I, it seems to me that there are few enough of them, like the people that I know who are in the trenches that do this regularly, we, we don't think it's hundreds of, of, of really bad guys pumping millions. You know, it, it's probably more dozens. And so yeah. um, enforcement, um, efficient enforcement targeting the you know, the actual carrier who's doing the bad stuff and the actual bad guy itself uh, could, could be useful uh, w without any class action plaintiffs involved. 
Well, for our last uh, presenter, we have Jimmy Garbert, um, who has some audiovisual uh, slides, so we'll let him show those. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Pace. And thanks, Carl, for your time today. So, for all of you who don't know, we started to say information services provider uh, that provides new your customer solutions to over 7,000 leading brands and enterprises globally. But we also provide and are the largest caller ID solutions provider in the telecom marketplace today, servicing over tens of billions of number to name linkages every month. And we are also the co writer of the STIR standard with Comcast. So this is a very important aspect for Newstar and where we see this evolution going. So everybody knows the numbers that are out there. The voice calling channel right now is there's fundamentally a lack of trust that is in this voice calling channel. And it is something that we collectively have to work together. Again, we hear 88% of business calls go answered. We've seen plenty of times where it's 98% of Because when the consumer receives a phone call and they don't know who's on the other end of that, nobody's gonna answer that. I mean, I look across this room and I know everybody here will raise their hands and sometime over the past week, they've received a call that they didn't know that phone number. And I bet you, all of you did not answer that phone call. That is an absolute problem, and that's why, as Kevin said, this is bipartisan. This is something that we all need to collectively work together. So, what does that mean? At the end of the day, look, this is tough. There's a lot of pain that's being inflicted across all organizations. But I can tell US Telecom, AT&T, Verizon, we're all in this to solve it together. There are bad actors that we need to ultimately get out of this middle ground that is creating these problems. But in the solutions that have been provided out there, it's created some friction. It'll be different tagging type issues that have been out there, some types of call blocking. And what can we collectively do together? That's the most important thing, is that as an industry across the telcos, as across the legitimate businesses that need to communicate clearly with their customer, that we work together to solve this challenge and eradicate these illegal actors that are out there pushing all these phone calls in the market. So the challenge though, as we know, is that there are a lot of these walled gardens out there. Again, there are great analytics companies, the mobile operators are out there, but there's a lot of different channels that you need to get through. For large mobile operators, also the landline market, which is still over 100 plus odd million devices, all of that creates this challenge, this disparate, fragmented network that we need to collectively work together to solve. So what are we excited about? So Newstar today is working across the industry with the leading analytics companies, the operators that are out there, as well as the mobile app companies, and being able to showcase how we can take information, register it across the industry, and make certain that when these calls are made, they are not tagged incorrectly. But part of this, and the big driver behind it, is we need to understand the metrics. What, what is the challenge that's really shown? What are the facts? And then how do we take that and, and apply best practices to make certain that the legitimate phone calls actually get presented and do not get tagged in the ground? It is the first step of where we need to go in ultimately to authenticate these phone calls. So the evolution of these pilots then goes into stir shaping. So as the uh, telcos continue to roll out their infrastructure, now we can create these trust domains and bring it out into the enterprises. We're gonna be making these legitimate phone calls. So we know, hey, who is that source of a phone call? And then make certain it's presented correctly down to that consumer. So this is information that we're gonna be gleaning over the next couple of months through these industry pilots. And again, I think everyone in here who's part of this uh, industry pilot, I'm very excited for the results that that ultimately will show. And then how we roll that into best practices that ultimately take it into stir and shaking as well. And so the last part that I want to make is there's an opportunity right now when it comes to that voice channel is when you think about the advent of the smartphones and, and everything that's gone on and, and just the revolution that has caused, the one thing that ultimately really hasn't been changed is that voice calling experience. But how can enterprises and businesses provide more information now? Let's take the infrastructure and the, and the technology that we're building to stop this illegal robocall, to actually provide more information, improve that engagement between the brand and the consumer. That's what we are collectively here working together today, and what I'm excited about of where we can take this into the future. Thanks, Carl. Well, thank you. Um, we're 
almost out of time, so I want to open it up to questions from the floor because this is a unique opportunity to ask the people in the know uh, to get answers to your question about how we can address this problem. Good question, Chris. So you talked about um, the microphone. There you go. Talk about a robo score. So, for example, in the collections industry, it's common to use a local caller ID, you know, to call different regions of the company of the country. And short duration calls are also very common. So, how do you differentiate like legitimate collection agencies doing this practice who might show up as a high robo score based on the criteria you were talking about? Yeah, no, I, I completely get that it's possible that a, a, a perfectly legal caller could have a robo score because this is completely not, it's a non subjective score, right? So it's just objective traffic metrics. And there's no question that a perfectly legal call could um, end up with a pattern that, that mimics what we see with the illegal robocalling. And if that's the case, we simply look at it and say, hey, you know, um, okay, it's debt collection that mimics, um, not a problem, right? But this is just sort of a, a, a very much a starting point to start, to start looking at. You know who's worth kind of looking at a little bit more, and the spoofing, the so-called spoofing that you do when you use a local number, is very different than the than the spoofing that we're talking about detecting here, right? I mean, the the, the neighbor spoofing that these guys are doing, typically is evasion spoofing. So it's not one number that's being used in a region of the country. It's literally every single call being outpulsed with the last four or five digits <coughs> kind of randomized. So that's that's one of the key differences, really. You guys uh, talked about short codes and the registration process for that. I, I do a lot of those, and I've also heard, and I'd, I'd love to know uh, if everybody's looking at this, that on the long code side of things, they, that, uh, Verizon, I think specifically, at least from what some of my carriers have been telling me, that the wholesalers, the Twilios, et cetera, are considering uh, charging a fee for you know guaranteed throughput, and you'll have to go through that same registration process. Uh, similar to a short code. There's a lot of uh, enterprises don't want to use short codes if the messages are meant to be conversational and they're meant to have local presence. So I'm just curious if all the carriers are looking at enabling long codes to have deliverability like a short code would for a, a transactional fee. Yeah, so I have to admit that from a Verizon point of view, I'm not really um, familiar with the SMS and the sort of the, the text products that are that are out there. Um, I agree with Linda's comment that, you know, part of, it, it's always been my impression that the reason that we have less um, spam text messaging is largely the, the fact that you can know your customer more effectively in that space and, and wherever it goes, I think we need to make sure that, that we don't um, incentivize or facilitate more spamming. But um, I, I can get back to you if you want more details, but it's not my area. I know that we are looking at ways to <clears throat> ensure that the messages go through with, with, without the short codes in certain circumstances, but I'm, I don't have the details on that. I don't know if we're looking at charging. Time for about one more question. Yep, one more question. Carl, may I ask a question of the audience if there aren't any other questions? Um, uh, so, so you asked about potential regulatory ideas here, and, and as you've heard, we're more interested in leaning in on regulation where, where it can be appropriately tailored. And I've always thought that Congress should punch up the Truth and Caller ID Act, which currently says it's illegal to spoof only if you're committing fraud um, or trying to cause harm, right? Um, and if somebody's committing fraud or trying to cause harm, then who cares if they're spoofing? You can just nail them for fraud or, or, or whatever the DDoS attack is or something. Does, does anybody disagree with my instinct, and this is just me personally talking, not Verizon officially, that shouldn't it be illegal to spoof any phone number that hasn't either been assigned to you or that you have consent to be calling from? Because a lot of you have your own phone numbers spoofed by bad guys that's not illegal. So I guess my question is, for the for the TCP lawyers and the Truth and Caller ID people in this room, you know, um, who would care about that kind of a legislative um, effort, does anybody sort of think that that's a bad idea? Is the question? 
Um, I'll, add one, I'll add one comment on that, in that uh, from my understanding and shake it and stir, um, if there is, for example, a call center or business process outsourcer that's originating calls using numbers that they did not obtain from their carrier, but they're authorized from their client to mm -hmm. use them, under Shaken and Stir, they probably would have to um, submit some sort of evidence to the carrier in order to have the calls being attested to that they are they are uh, authorized to use those numbers. So the, the scheme of requiring some sort of evidence of authorization seems to be built into the Shaken and Stir framework. And, and for that reason, I think it's a very good idea. I'll just say that I, I kind of agree with Carl saying shake and, shake and stir would be the definitive answer to that. But I think it's know your customer. And I think that uh, these carriers that we're talking about, before you put a customer on the network, I think there should be a standard, you know, a background check, some standard that any of these VoIP carriers or anybody should be able to go through. It could be by using a third party, but I think it should be defined. And that way, traceback would be a whole lot easier. Uh, and because uh, we're completely against, I can tell you, and no one in this room uh, supports neighborhood spoofing and robocalls, which is the broadcast of pre-recorded messages, and it's it's decimating our industry. So we're on the same page. But in terms of what you asked specifically, I think that because we're most a lot of us service bureaus represent multiple different companies, we had authorization to use these numbers on their behalf. Mm -hmm. It would be if if we couldn't do that, it would be extremely problematic. I don't know how you would regulate that. I think know your customer defining a set of standards that the VoIP carriers that you're talking about must go through so the traceback is a lot easier. Um, and then, you know, I think some of that activity should become legal, uh, illegal and, and be able to be prosecuted that way. Chris, one more question. question. One, one, well, just one. And because quick, it's Bob, we've got to take it. One quick, <laughs> one quick follow up to that. And that is if you look at the different pieces of state legislation that are, that, that are starting to come out, uh, there are some of them, there's some consistency in, in the state stuff. So we're not fighting any of that. We're, we're, you know, we're saying, yeah, penalizing, yeah, continue. I mean, there are a few things that we try to get carved out every now and again, but generally there's some consistency in the states. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we'll ever get nationalized legislation for that. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I think this is one area where actually some national, you know, across the board standard would, would make sense because the, the, where the states perceive a gap, they tend to go in and then you have kind of a disparate system where you have to think about New York differently than you know, next door, and um, and I think that the numbering system is one area where, where really federalizing a lot, some of this may make some sense. I agree. Well, thank you for our panelists for participating.